Uh, thank you for coming. My name is Pavel Leszczyński. I'm the Hadoop product owner at Allegro. I hope not to use buzzword big data anymore during this presentation. And yeah, it's five o'clock. It's already the end of the conference. And let's say we'll talk about phishing, about phishing on a data lake. It sounds more interesting than Hadoop. Uh, OK. Uh, Allegro. I bet all of you know the Allegro. Uh, Allegro owns more than 50% of Polish e-commerce market. It owns more than 80% of local mobile commerce market. Every month, we've got more than 14 million active users uh, that generate more than 200 million visits and more than 3 billion page views. Uh, every day, every month, every minute, we've got more than 600 transactions on site. So it's quite a lot. Allegro Tech is our technical brand. Uh, it's also Allegro.tech is uh, our technical blog when you can find our findings, which sometimes may be useful and interesting. Okay, and so let's move to the story of data lake. So in order to have a data lake, you need to dig a hole in the ground. Uh, we started the process four years ago, and the task was given to the youngest sysadmin on a team. Uh, perhaps because of the fact he didn't know how difficult it is, and he managed to do so. Uh, so it took us about six to eight months to deploy production-ready Hadoop cluster, and what we have done from the scratch, we really invested in in-house skills. So we let our people go to New York, to California, to the big data conferences, uh, to stay in touch in newest technologies, so that when something wrong happens, when we have a problem, we've got our in-house skills to solve this problem. Okay. Uh, once you have a dig in the hole in the ground, you, you need to pull some water into, and uh, which is actually data. Our first use case was clickstream. So the event sent from browsers, from mobile applications, and it's uh, currently more than 46% of the data on our Hadoop cluster. The second important use case are logs. We gather logs from services, applications, and other systems. We've got our in-house built service called Logger. Uh, mainly, we direct logs to Elasticsearch and Kibana within shortened retention, like 30 days. So Kibana, it's pretty cool to, to browse the logs, search the logs. And optionally, you can store your logs on Hadoop uh, if you need them. To, to be stored for ages. Uh, the third and actually the most important data source are events sent between messages, so between services. So our ar architecture is built on the top of microservices that communicate through message bus. We massively use Apache Kafka, and every business logic event goes through Apache Kafka, and we grab them all into HDFS so that we have um, data from services. Uh, okay, in September 2014, we had about 450 terabytes of data. In February this year, we reached the amount of two petabytes. Currently, we have something like two and a half petabytes. And the real question to that slide is, so what? So the size of the data doesn't mean anything. The thing is, what can you do with the data? So you've got the hole in the ground, you've got some water put into, and yeah, fishers need to come and catch the fish. That's, that's the story. Uh, you may wonder what are the use cases for Hadoop at Allegro. Uh, so if you probably know, uh, the most common e-commerce use cases are uh, improve your search engine, build recommendation system, uh, make analysts do their analysis on the cluster, and the one pretty interesting case is, uh, comes from microservices. So when you want to change something in microservices or something goes wrong, you want to rebuild the state of the microservice. And on Hadoop, you've got all the history of the past events for 60, 30 days, whatever you want, so that you can rebuild the state and, of the service and make it work again. Okay, uh, I don't know if you have any artificial lake in the neighborhood. Uh, I'm from Toronto and we have some because of highways. And these are extremely dangerous places. So people go, in, go into, they want to check if the water is warm. 
Uh, then they make one step further and it's really steep and they get drowned. And the same thing can happen to your Hadoop cluster if you are not running it in a secured mode. It's an example from Spotify uh, where someone tries to remove his tiny, totally unimportant directory. Unfortunately, there is a white space in a path. Uh, which can lead to serious data loss. Uh, fortunately, from the scratch, we are running our Hadoop cluster in a secure mode. When we started, it was uh, already available. Uh, yeah, and you need to make a fence around your data lake in order to nothing bad, nothing bad to happen. And once we did it, we had some configuration file where we stored what users have what permissions to what sources. And then it became a problem because every time someone said, hey, I would like to gain permissions to some new data source, okay, we need to edit the file, rerun the puppet, and it takes from 20 to 40 minutes. Uh, 20 to 40 minutes of silly, unimportant, and boring job, actually. Uh, last year, we managed to move into Active Directory so that our Hadoop cluster is integrated with Active Directory. If someone wants to gain permissions, he goes to IT support, uh, then IT support asks data owner and the supervisor of the requester for an, for an acceptance. If it is okay, it's done automatically. We don't have to do anything. And since that time, there are more than 380 IT support issues on our Jira. Uh, that's a lot, that 380 times, times 20 to 40 minutes of silly, boring uh, job that we don't need to do, fortunately. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, what about fishers? Yeah? We need to catch some fish. Uh, the best way to start fishing is Hue web application. Uh, I will show you some movie. So it's a Hue web application where you can log into with your Active Directory credentials. It allows you to execute SQL query on our Hadoop cluster. And SQL is really the best way to start because I bet all of you know the SQL. And the SQL is translated uh, into MapReduce paradigm jobs and it's run on a cluster and yeah, terabytes of data or even petabytes uh, are read to, to get the result. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but anyways, I, what I wanted to show that everything is done for the browser. Uh, you don't need uh, to uh, open command line to or thing like, things like that. In this example, at the end, we will see the diagram of uh, our site's traffic group by an hour to see uh, on which time uh, the biggest traffic we have. Uh, Hue allows us to do a lot of basic jobs on our Hadoop cluster, so we can execute a query we can uh, see the jobs that are actually running now. We can also uh, view other tables and databases, so browse other data we have on a cluster. We can browse the HDFS system to, to see what data do we have. And we can create some workflows that are, let's say, tasks that can be scheduled at a given time. Uh, at the end, of some, after a couple of minutes, we get a result. Uh, within here, we can draw some simple chart. If the colors are not okay, we can download it to the spreadsheet and make it uh, more colorful. And uh, this is allowed because all of the data on our Hadoop cluster uh, can be read from SQL. We uh, really use, make use of Hive Metastore. Every time we have a data on a cluster, uh, we put some information on Hive Metastore so that uh, you don't need to rely on HDFS locations. Even if we don't know the structure of a table, we create tables with one column uh, to allow people using SQL. And uh, yeah, when we started deploying Hue, we arranged a set of workshops for our employees in every location. We had more than 130 persons that visited the workshop to show them how easy is that. Uh, they don't need much time and they, they can use the tool. And uh, the problem with Hue users is that they are mostly newbies. So they just started playing with Hadoop and Hive and there are some funny stories with them. So the first thing is 
let's say I've got some really, really big partition table and I just want to look, have a look what the data is inside. So uh, select from the table without an aware condition and then it turns out that things are really bad, that there are plenty of mappers running on a cluster, that for each partition hive goes to Zookeeper and uh, locks the partition. So there are thousands of requests that go to Zookeeper and uh, yeah, we, we've got problems and the guy doesn't know what's happening. Uh, fortunately, from some time we've got Hive strict mode enabled, so we don't allow such queries. You need to give uh, uh, some filter on partitioned columns uh, in a where clause. The other thing is, uh, let's say I'm going to join some table. I'm going to join uh, my really big table with some smaller table, other table, and at the end with the really, really small table, and then we hear this hive is, hive is a piece of shit. It takes four hours to execute the query. What's wrong? It turns out that if you change the order of joins within your SQL, uh, this time can be reduced from four hours to 27 minutes. So anytime the biggest table should appear the last uh, in, in, in a SQL statement. Uh, yeah, we're talking about hive and phishing and you know, I always recall the story of Ernest Hemingway, the old man and the sea. So the guy did his best, so his best to get the fish. Uh, he managed to kill it, uh, but the fish destroyed his boat. Uh, he didn't manage to get it onto a boat. And once he was going back home, sharks have eaten all the fish. They, they've eaten all the meat. He came back with head, backbone and skin, nothing valuable. And you know, if you see a SQL statement that is more than 100 lines long with case when, case then, uh, you wonder, is it really the best tool to make the job done? So if you know a little bit of programming, you could have done it better, faster, and without so many lines of code. The other thing is that Hive automatically translates SQL into MapReduce paradigm jobs. And this automatic translation is not always perfect. So if you know a little bit of programming, you could have done it better in many cases. And the answer to this question, so the solution to the problem is Apache Spark, which is massively used at Allegro. Uh, there are two ways of using Apache Spark at Allegro. Uh, analysts use it. I call them Analyst 3.0. And uh, the easiest way to start are Python Spark notebooks. So that everything can be done uh, through the browser. Uh, you log into Jupyter Allegro Group Com uh, site, uh, you browse your notebooks that you already have or open a new one. Uh, the first cell of the code is something you need to copy paste. It starts your Spark job on Hadoop cluster, you define application name. Uh, yarn queue when you want to deploy a job, a uh, number of instances, and let's say the size of RAM uh, given to each uh, executor. It takes up to 60 minutes, let's say a minute, 60 seconds, up to a minute before the job starts. And after that, you simply send operations to the job, send commands that need to be executed. So you can work with the tool in an uh, interactive way. Uh, working with Hive interactively is, it doesn't work at all. So you can add, add some additional libraries. Uh, in this example, we generate random points with coordinates between minus one and one. And if the sum of squares of coordinates is less than one, then this is probably the point within a circle. Uh, we can plot it. Uh, and actually, this is a cool method of evaluating pi. If you generate a lot of points and count the number of the points that are within the circle, you got the quarter of pi, uh, which you can uh, process on, on the Hadoop cluster. Uh, once we deploy it, we will see that our job is running uh, on the Hadoop cluster. Uh, so you can, we can go to a new tab in a moment. And uh, we've got some console where we show 
the tasks that are actually that are currently run on the cluster we see our job uh, we can go to spark console and see what's happening without the, within this uh, spark job uh, is it map reduce face or anything else at the end we can see the result of the pi not so bad but it's not perfect it's not the best method for evaluating pi it's just a cool method to show distributed processing uh, okay so these this is the second group of our fissures and let's uh, write some code they are almost professionals so they are professionals, sorry. But the most professional group is, so if, you, if you are talking about fishing, it's something like Deadly Sketch. I don't know if it's like this uh, TV series on Discover. These are the guys that uh, try to grab some crabs on the Barents Sea. Uh, there is something like minus 30, minus 40 degrees, and uh, many of them die. Uh, <laughs> What, that's why this uh, sub uh, this is the title, and they mostly die to due to drowning or hypothermia. And let's say our job as the infrastructure team is to give them tools <laughs> so that they can make their job done. They can grab the crops and come safely home. And uh, actually, what we want to do is to let them focus on a business logic, let them focus on the uh, data processing and skipping uh, some other uh, technical things. And uh, a couple of months ago, we had a project at our company, which was Allegro App Engine. Uh, we want our developers to focus on business logic things and avoid doing things like bamboo plants, uh, Git repositories, and things like that. So. Uh, within a console, you can create your new service. You, you give its name, uh, some description, domain and context. We use it for to cluster our services to know more or less what it's about, what, what it does. And uh, after that, you're allowed to choose uh, the template of your project. One of them is Spark Scala template. So the one that you will deploy uh, on Hadoop, you give an Active Directory group that will have an access to this project. Click Create. Uh, it takes one up to two minutes. And then we will get a stash repository. So we will get a fork of our template project. Uh, we will get all Bamboo plans to build, to deploy the task. Uh, after a while, you will get an email with all the links that are important to your project. Uh, so that you don't need to do this job that can be done by a machine. So it's, it's a repeat, repeatable job, there is no sense to, to make it on your own. Uh, okay, we got an email, we can see there is a stash repository of our project with some readme that tells you what's inside, how can you build it, uh, how can you deploy it. Uh, there is also a link to Bamboo. We use Atlassian Jira. Uh, you can open your, this project in IDE. You got some example of the code which tries to evaluate Pi, uh, as it is a cool example. Uh, you've got also two important configuration files, one where you can uh, choose how to deploy the job on Hadoop. So what yarn QE, uh, what username and password, uh, uh, what is the technical user account that will deploy the job? And the third interesting thing is an um, OZI workflow XML. So we deploy the jobs with OZI. You've got some an example uh, workflow XML, which allows you to run the job once. If you want to rerun it every day, you simply go to OZI documentation and change some couple of lines here in order to, to make it work through OZI. Uh, it's done automatically. You want, perhaps you will need to change it, but it allows you to build your project uh, just with clicking without writing any lines of code. We can go to Bamboo, start deployment, and after a while, we will see that our Spark job is uh, running on the cluster. Uh, okay. So we see some logs, uh, which may be interesting with uh, something go, goes wrong. The real point is 
you focus on your code, you focus on what you're gonna do, uh, not on the tool set. This should just work, nothing more. After that, you can go to uh, Hue Web Console and uh, look for this job. We use some other technical account and you can find there is a first job, it's probably Uzi Scheduler. After that, you see uh, the, the other job, uh, which is Spark by example, we have been talking about. Okay. Uh, so the results, this diagram is actually interesting instead of the first one with data size. So this is the yarn usage. We schedule, we, we, we use, uh, this shows how many bytes, terabytes of RAM uh, do we use on average on our Hadoop cluster. At the beginning of 2015, it was less than half a terabyte. Uh, at, in February 2016, we used on average something like four and a half terabytes of RAM. So this really means that we've got fishers on our data lake and they go and try to catch fish whatever the way they like. Uh, currently, uh, we've got more than two and a half terabytes of RAM on our Hadoop cluster in one DC. Yeah, we'll try to make another Hadoop cluster or the same Hadoop cluster in another DC. And uh, the question is, oh, I don't know if you like Monty Python, fishy, fishy, fish. Uh, is it in a cupboard? And the question is, what the story tells about the meaning of life? Uh, because we had the story about fishing, uh, catching a fish, and tools it for the fishers. And the thing is that the story also tells what can be done in order to introduce any new technology into your stack? So the first thing is build your in-house skills. So if you've got technology with no in-house skills, you can get stacked. Uh, the second thing is go to your clients, go to your users, even within company. Arrange workshops for them, show them how to use it, show them the value that they can get from the tool. Uh, the third thing is automate. Automate, automate, but automate when needed. So as with Active Directory use case, automate because you can spend a lot of time doing silly things. We've also automating setting up Hadoop cluster, uh, Kafka clusters, Apache, cluster, cl Apache Kafka clusters. It takes now a couple of minutes and all is done by Terraform. Uh, the other thing is we rely on open source projects. If we encounter a bug, uh, we fix it and send it back to community. So we get something and we gain something in return. Uh, the other tip that we are using is arrange hackathons. If you wanted to choose some technology like scheduler, like best SQL engine, uh, grab the people from different teams, get them for two days into one location, check different things, go for a beer, uh, end it with some report and recommendation. Uh, don't make decisions on your own as a technology provider to end users. Uh, um, uh, invite them to, to make a decision together. Uh, okay. I think that's it. Any questions? I see. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we've got one cluster, uh, we've got uh, soft and hard limits on YARN. So we don't see a problem with critical tasks, they always have the guarantee that they will get uh, the amount of RAM. Uh, the problem is that we have one cluster in a single DC. Uh, this can lead to some issues, so for the time now we are thinking of a second cluster. So we need to do it, we already have the machines. Uh, but the question is, shall it be two separate clusters on one combined? Shall we use Vandisco or do something on our own? Perhaps there are some open source, open source solution. It's an open question. We, we don't have an answer for, for this.